Are you seeing this video that is trending? Come, come and watch it. Come and watch it. Look at it now. Well, I think that Reverend Father should first of all take care of those his holy sacraments, praying to Mary, bowing down and knocking his head on hard grounds and all of that. He should take care of all of that first before he comes to talk to us about doctrine in this side of the world. <clears throat> so here is my open response to Dr. Abel Damina on the two Jesus's controversy. Let me play the first video that provoked my response. There are two Jesuses in the Bible. There's the incarnate Christ, which was not useful to me. Then there's the glorified Christ. These are two different Christs. Let me tell you, there was one miracle Jesus couldn't do as the incarnate. He couldn't do it. As the incarnate Christ, he couldn't do one particular miracle. And that's the miracle of miracles. He couldn't. Yeah, he couldn't. He did everything. Death, dumb, everything. Raised the dead and all that. But he couldn't get anybody born again. But when he died, he changed. When he rose, he said, all power in heaven, on earth, under the earth, is given to me. Now, Paul puts it like this. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That you may know the hope of your calling. What is the exceeding greatness of the riches of his grace? And the exceeding greatness of his power to us world who believe. That exceeding greatness of his power is called in the Greek the Hooper Balloon. Hooper Balloon means power that goes beyond target. It is targeted at you, but it went beyond you to perform extra. And after watching this, I made a rejoinder. I gave a response that there can never be two Jesuses in the Bible. We cannot separate his mission. His mission is whole and entire. So separating the Jesus before the incarnation and after the resurrection could lead us to heresy. He got to read my response and was apparently upset. Then he responded with this video. That priest, some Catholic priest, who did a review of my teaching that has said that there are two Jesuses in the Bible. Well, he didn't listen well because as a preacher... You don't cut things out of context. I was making an explanation in scripture. And I was talking about the incarnate Christ. And I was talking about the resurrected Christ. I was talking about the incarnate Christ. And I was talking about the first begotten from the dead. And I took time to make illustration for the purposes of understanding. I wasn't saying there are two Jesus like one Jesus and another different Jesus. There's an incarnate Christ which was not useful to me then there's a glorified christ these are two different christs what i meant was the jesus in the incarnation is not the same jesus in the resurrection something changed in the resurrection the same person but two different offices in the incarnation he was limited he had power under heaven in the resurrection he had power in heaven on earth and under the earth. In the incarnation, he couldn't give life to anybody. Because except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. In the resurrection, he gives life to everybody. In the incarnation, he has limited knowledge. He says of that day and hour, no one knoweth. But in the resurrection... All things and judgment and knowledge has been committed to him. So I was looking at the differences. In the incarnation, his name was under heaven. He was anointed of the Holy Ghost. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. But in the resurrection, he is the one anointing man with the Holy Ghost. So I was making a difference between the incarnate Christ and the resurrected Christ. The incarnate Christ came through the womb of Mary. He manifested through the womb of Mary. The resurrected Christ was conceived in the womb of the dead. That's why he's the first begotten from the dead. And in the resurrection, God has given him a name that was not there in the incarnation. <clears throat> 
And I said that when I was teaching some years ago. And they took it out of context. And they have pushed it out. And they are doing all kinds of insidiousness on it. How can Dr. Damina say there are two Jesuses? Well, you didn't listen well. Because if you are listening well. With the intention of learning and understanding. You will have seen the point I was making. But you know you guys in Power City. You have come of age. When you see such things. You know that is bull crap. Because you are in this house enough to know what I teach. And what I don't teach. <clears throat> Well, I think that Reverend Father should first of all take care of those his holy sacraments, praying to Mary, bowing down and knocking his head on hard grounds and all of that. He should take care of all of that first before he comes to talk to us about doctrine in this side of the world. <clears throat> so friends, apparently you can see that both videos contradict each other. Dr. Damina, since you have begged to be understood in context, I shall address this second video of yours which is believed to be a clearest explanation of the concept of the two Jesuses. And I need you, Abel Damina, to listen to this with an objective mind, receptive to learning. And my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us take his points one after the other. And I was talking about the incarnate Christ, and I was talking about the resurrected Christ. I was talking about the incarnate Christ, and I was talking about the first begotten from the dead. And I took time to make illustration for the purposes of understanding. I wasn't saying there are two Jesus like one Jesus and another different Jesus. What I meant was the Jesus in the incarnation is not the same Jesus in the resurrection. Something changed in the resurrection. Now quoting you verbatim, the Jesus in the incarnation is not the same Jesus in the resurrection, something changed. So, Dr. Damina, you claim that the incarnate Jesus and the resurrected Jesus are different. Unfortunately, this contradicts both scripture and orthodox Christian teaching of the personhood of Christ. There is no separation as to before and after resurrection. Rather, there is one Jesus who is the same throughout all stages of his existence on earth. Hebrews 13 verse 8 states clearly, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, you said that the incarnate Christ was not useful to you. Remember? There's an incarnate Christ, which was not useful to me. Then there's a glorified Christ. These are two different Christs. Unfortunately, you apparently do not know that God becoming flesh, that is the incarnation, is foundational to salvation. Without incarnation, there would be no sacrifice for sins. Hebrews 2, 14 to 17 explains that Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might destroy the devil and free those who were held in slavery by the fear of death. Likewise, Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 4, that Christ's death and resurrection are of first importance because they are by the means by which we are saved. So if the incarnate Christ, that is Jesus, before resurrection is not useful to you or is useless to you as it means, then it indicates that he didn't die for you and that you are not saved, you are still a pagan. Then this makes it worse. How dare you call yourself a pastor, preach and pray for people yes. when you are apparently not saved and still a pagan because the incarnate Jesus, the pre-resurrection Jesus is not useful to you. Yes, the glorification of Christ is important. His resurrection is important. But it is in his incarnation that made the glorification or the resurrection possible. Again, return to Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 and let us read better. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Allow this to sink. This verse affirms the immutable nature of Jesus across all stages of his existence. The pre-incarnation, incarnation, and glorification. Let us examine another point you made in your video. In the incarnation, he was limited. He had power under heaven. In the resurrection, 
he had power in heaven on earth and under the earth while it is true that jesus voluntarily accepted limitations in his human nature during the incarnation as we see in philippians 2 verse 6 to 8 this does not mean that jesus was different or less divine before his resurrection philippians 2 explains that jesus though in the form of god emptied himself and took on human nature this self-emptying or kenosis as we understand was an act of humility but it did not diminish his divine identity. Jesus never ceased being God. Even when he accepted human limitations, as seen in John chapter 1, verse 14, where the world became flesh and dwelt among us. That is why in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, it says that when God brought forth his firstborn into the world, it says, let all God's angels worship him. So when Jesus took a human nature and became man, he did not cease to be God. That Jesus was worshipped by the angels, as we noted in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6, we understand better, or it serves as a strong evidence of his divine status and his supremacy over all creation, including the heavens themselves. This worship signifies not only the recognition of Jesus' divinity, but also his authority over all realms both earthly and heavenly. Let us return to that Bible verse again. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, it states, And again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. This verse is important because it reveals that from the moment of Christ's incarnation and birth, Jesus was acknowledged as worthy of worship, a reverence that is due to God alone. The angels who themselves dwell in heaven bow in adoration before the infant Jesus, indicating his superiority even over the heavenly beings. If Jesus, even as a newborn in his incarnate state, is worshipped by the angels, it logically follows that he possesses authority and power above the heavens, not merely under them. Worship is a recognition of supreme authority and divinity. By commanding the angels to worship Christ, God the Father is affirming that Jesus holds a status equal to his own, divine, omnipotent, and eternal, as the Lord of heaven and earth. This was his power in heaven. So when you tell us that Jesus had no authority in the heavens before his resurrection, this is clearly false. The worship of Christ at his birth by the heavenly creatures indicates his supremacy over them, his authority in heaven. And having explained Christ's authority in heaven at his birth, we already understand that while on earth during his ministry, Christ exercised the use of his authority. We have yes. this in Mark chapter 2, verse 5 to 12, where Jesus forgave sins, a prerogative only God has. In verse 10 of that second chapter of Mark, Jesus says, But to prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Other verses which demonstrate Jesus' authority are Mark chapter 4, verse 39 to 41. We have John chapter 10, verse 17 to 18. This was his power and authority on earth. Therefore, Jesus' divine authority was already present during his incarnation. Inasmuch as Jesus' humanity involved some real limitations, like in space and time, but his divine nature and authority were never absent. The limitations Jesus experienced in his humanity are part of the mystery of the incarnation, but do not imply a deficiency in his divinity. Let me prove to you that Jesus had power under the earth, even before his resurrection as you falsely thought. The miracle of coming the storm in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, and walking on water in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33, both suggest that Jesus' authority extends not just over the visible aspect of nature, but also over the forces under the earth. This is a phrase used in scripture to denote the realm of the dead or the forces of chaos. In ancient understanding, the sea, 
was often seen as the abode of demonic powers or the underworld. By controlling the sea and working upon it, Jesus shows that he has dominion over all forces, whether they are in the heavens, on the earth, or beneath the earth. Yes. Let us take another point of it and deflate it immediately. In the incarnation, he couldn't give life to anybody because except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. In the resurrection, he gives life to everybody. Again, this is false. Even during his earthly ministry, Jesus had the power to give life, both spiritually and physically. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Jesus declares himself as the source of life before his own resurrection. And Jesus gave spiritual life during his incarnation before his resurrection. As we see in John chapter 5, verse 21, he says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Also in John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Has what? Eternal life. Now the present tense, has, yeah, signifies that believers received eternal life through faith in Christ Jesus during his incarnation. Also, in John chapter 11, verse 43 to 44, Jesus gives physical life. He raises Lazarus from the dead, clearly exercising his divine power to give physical life. So even before his resurrection, Mr. Damina, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The fact that he raises Lazarus and others, including Jairus' daughter from the dead, is a clear demonstration of his life-giving power, even during his incarnate ministry. Let us take another point of yours. In the incarnation, he has limited knowledge. He says, of that day and hour, no one knoweth. But in the resurrection, all things and judgment and knowledge has been committed to him. Wow. So we have to really understand the meaning of the verb to know in Greek, ginosko, in this passage. It is pertinent to delve into its meaning before coming out to say Christ did not know. In the New Testament Greek, that is in the Koine Greek, ginosko, that is to know, is a versatile verb that encompasses a range of meanings from simple awareness or acquaintance to deep experiential knowledge. The interpretation of ginosko should not be limited to mere mental awareness, but should also be seen as an acknowledgement or recognition with relational and convedental implications. How do I mean? The usage does not suggest that Jesus lacks knowledge of the day and hour. Instead, it indicates his intentional choice to withhold this information in alignment with the Father's will. This understanding is reinforced by Jesus to his disciple just before his ascension. He says, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. This we have in Acts chapter 1 verse 7. This is even after his resurrection. Even after his resurrection, he still withheld certain knowledge. Now, this intentional limitation of certain knowledge to God the Father further explains or emphasizes that Christ's mission did not include revealing specific aspects of the divine plan. Little wonder, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, Christ enjoyed in his human knowledge the fullness of understanding of the eternal plans he had come to reveal. What he admitted not to know in this area, he elsewhere declared himself not sent to reveal. We can check this in CCC paragraph 474. Let us take another point of Abel Damina. In the incarnation, his name was under heaven. He was anointed of the Holy Ghost. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. But in the resurrection, he is the one anointing men with the Holy Ghost. 
So I was making a difference between the incarnate Christ and the resurrected Christ. The incarnate Christ came through the womb of Mary. He manifested through the womb of Mary. The resurrected Christ was conceived in the womb of the dead. That's why he's the first begotten from the dead. And in the resurrection, God has given him a name that was not there in the incarnation. Mm -mm. Now, Daminas claim that God had given Jesus a name that was not there at the incarnation misunderstands totally the significance of Philippians 2 verse 9 to 11, which says that God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. This does not mean that Jesus lacked the significance of his name before the resurrection. Rather, this passage refers to the exaltation of Jesus in his human nature. Jesus had always divine authority, but after his resurrection, divine authority is fully revealed and universally acknowledged, but it has always been there. Thus, the name Jesus was already given at his incarnation in Matthew 1 verse 21, and this divine name as Lord, that is in Hebrew Adonai or Yahweh was eternally his, even before the incarnation. That was why even in his incarnation, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Why then did he claim the divine name of God, I am, even in his incarnation? And is there any other name above that divine name of God, I am? Is there any other name above such a name? There is no other name. So his divine name yes. has already been there. Even Isaiah, in prophesying about the birth of Christ in chapter 9, verse 6. It says, Unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government is on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This was the name of Jesus at his birth. Which other name is above this name? Tell me, Dr. Damina, tell me. Which other name was given to Christ after his resurrection that is above this name, given to him at his birth? Yes. Also, Damina's understanding of Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, which refers to Jesus as the firstborn from the dead, requires clarification here. The title indicates Jesus' preeminence in the resurrection. He is the first to rise to eternal life, never to die again. However, this does not imply that Jesus was conceived in the womb of the dead as he erroneously taught. This is a misunderstanding of what resurrection means. Resurrection in Christian theology does not involve being conceived anew, but being raised to a new life. So by claiming Jesus was not a different person after his resurrection, we must admit that it was the same Jesus who had been crucified and buried, but now glorified. Theologically, Jesus' resurrection is a transformation of his human body into a glorified state is rising to new life but his identity remains unchanged his glorified body is the same the same body that bore the marks of the crucifixion we have john chapter 20 verse 27 where jesus shows the marks of the nails on his hands and his side and his feet so there is a continuity here between his pre-resurrection and post-resurrection states Okay, the same Jesus, but in his resurrection, he was glorified, but that doesn't make him more of a God than before the resurrection. Well, I think that Reverend Father should first of all take care of those his holy sacraments, praying to Mary, bowing down and knocking his head on hard grounds and all of that. He should take care of all of that first before he comes to talk to us about doctrine in this side of the world. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you're telling me to take care of my sacraments and um, the veneration of Mary and the saints before coming to talk to you. Now, have you taken care of your theology before bringing it out and spilling the wrong doctrine, the false theology? Because God will definitely hold you responsible on the last day. Now, you're talking about the sacrament and the Catholic processes. This is very important for us to understand. Um, this shows your uh, lack of understanding of Catholic theology. The same you that claimed to be misunderstood and begged to be understood in context is here guilty of the same offense 
by misunderstanding the Catholic practices and the doctrine of the church. In as much as the context you attempt to explain is still flawed and breeds a lot of theological fallacy and other errors, or what we could address as heretical. So please try to understand the Catholic sacraments and the intercession of the saints and Mary before coming to accuse the Catholic Church of something you don't really understand. Catholics do not pray to Mary in the sense of worshipping her. Rather, Catholics ask for Mary's intercession. Prayer means to ask, okay? You can ask God for something in prayer, for a favor, okay? You can ask your friend to pray for you. You can ask a pastor to pray for you. You can equally ask Mary and the saints to pray for you, okay? We honor or venerate Mary, acknowledging her role as a mother of Christ who cares for the church. She is the mother of Christ who is God. So just as she was there at Pentecost and she was there throughout the ministry of Christ and at the foot of the cross, the same way your members go to you and ask for prayers as a pastor. For us Catholics, we ask Mary and the saints to pray for us because even as they are no longer on earth, they really did not die, but are more alive in Christ. For our God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, as Christ says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 32. And these holy beings that have departed this world are witnesses that surround us. They can see and hear us. Okay, We have this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. So they seek for our welfare and pray for us, just as the souls of the martyrs under the altar in heaven cried out in the book of Revelation for justice, as we see in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 to 11. So this shows that there is a strong connection or link between the living and the dead in Christ. So the saints in heaven are not distant or inactive, but they are actively engaged in interceding for the living. So the practice of veneration, not worship, the veneration of Mary and the saints is grounded in our unique role in salvation history as seen in Luke chapter 1 verse 48. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Now I ask you, Damina, have you ever called Mary blessed? Do you live by this biblical truth? That is a question and a challenge to you. And as for the sacrament, these are channels of grace instituted by Christ. They are not mere practices, but they are means by which believers participate in the divine life of God. Also, physical gestures like bowing are expression of reverence and humility, practiced throughout Bible tradition. And leading in prayer is a widespread Christian practice, which signifies humility. All right? So, Dr. Damina, you unfortunately are the one doing a C gestures on the scriptural text. You're not doing what is called exegesis. You are doing exegesis, okay? You are reading your personal interpretation into that. You're not reading the scripture in context. You are guilty of hijacking many passages and taking them out of context to apply them differently to the way that suits your theology. And this is not proper. You have to read the scripture in context, all right? that you suddenly realize that prosperity gospel is false, a gospel which the Catholic Church had condemned from time immemorial, and you started preaching against prosperity gospel, which I myself equally commended you on my page. And this has made you won the admiration of many. But this doesn't mean that every other teaching you dish out there is true. I understand that you are in the process of discovering the truth, by your drifting away from the prosperity gospel. But I ask you, Damina, to patiently take your time and have your teachings evaluated before dishing them out. Finally, Dr. Damina, now that I've refuted your claims, I hereby challenge you to refute this rejoinder of mine that is my scriptural response. If truly what you preach is of God, I look forward to hearing from you. And dear friends in Christ, this is just the beginning of a uh, defense of the biblical truth and what Christ asks us to teach all nations. I'm always here. You can always send me any link or um, a write-up that seems worrying or disturbing to your faith, and we can evaluate it together and clarify the truth. You 
unalloyed truth from scripture as handed yes. down to the apostles to this present age. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, follow me, follow me. God bless you. Thank you.